Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're taking a glimpse into the future to see how Ryzen 3 will perform when it's released next week. Now you might be thinking, why not just wait a week and test it then? And well, honestly, uh, this is probably what I would have done, uh, but I spent the last week gathering all the results. I've done quite a bit of testing and it wasn't till last Friday that AMD officially announced uh, the release date and quite a few details. So I knew the Ryzen 3 release wasn't that far away, I just didn't realize it wasn't that far away. Anyway, I did the same thing just before Ryzen 5 was released and those results turned out to be 100% accurate, which was pretty unsurprising because Ryzen 5 and now Ryzen 3 are the same physical chips as Ryzen 7, uh, just with a certain degree of resources disabled. I explained why this is in a bit more detail in the Ryzen 5 simulated benchmark video, so I won't go all over that stuff again. But basically, when an 8-core CPU fails the quality control check with one or more cores, the defective cores are then shut off and the chip is binned as a lower-end part. AMD's likely been holding off releasing Ryzen 3 until they have enough defective CPUs that can't be sold as Ryzen 5 models. Basically Ryzen 3 is very similar to Ryzen 5, or the Ryzen 5 1400 I should say, with one key difference being that SMT support is now disabled. For those of you that don't know, SMT is basically AMD's version of Intel's hyperthreading. This means whereas the 1400 has four cores and eight threads, all Ryzen 3 CPUs will come with four cores, but just four threads. And that again, it's due to the lack of the SMT support. Like the 1400, the Ryzen 3 1300X and 1200 will feature an eight megabyte level three cache, support for dual channel DDR4 2666 memory, and will be given a 65 watt TDP rating. The Ryzen 3 specs are set in concrete now. The 1300X will operate at a base frequency of 3.5 GHz with a boost frequency of 3.7 GHz, while the slightly lower end 1200 will operate at 3.1 GHz with a boost frequency of 3.4 GHz. Both are unlocked parts, so for enthusiasts on a budget, it makes little sense to opt for the more expensive 1300X. The 1300X is suggested, or rather rumoured at this point, to be priced at $130 US, while the 1200 is set to come in at just $110 US. Saving $40 by purchasing the R3 1300X over the R5 1400 probably won't be worth it. That said though, the $60 saving offered by the R3 1200 should be a lot more enticing. The question is, how much slower does disabling SMT make Ryzen 3? And how do they compare with similarly priced Intel CPUs? Actually, comparing Ryzen 3 with equivalent Intel CPUs at these price points is a little tricky because the Intel CPUs here make no sense whatsoever. As I've touched on numerous times in the past, the Pentium G4560 eliminates everything right up to the Core i5-7400. That means everything priced between $64 US and $182 US is completely pointless, ruling out Intel's entire KB Lake Core i3 range. And again, this placed the Ryzen 3 CPUs in an awkward spot at $110 and $130 US. That said, if they can take it to the locked Core i5 part, such as the 7400 and 7500, then they will have earned themselves a comfortable position in the market segment. So without wasting any more time, let's see how the Ryzen 3 CPUs look as we take the Ryzen 5 1400, disable SMT and adjust the boost and base clock speeds accordingly. Starting off, I took a look at the memory bandwidth performance just to make sure everything was in check here. As expected, disabling SMT support had no impact on memory bandwidth, and when paired with DDR4-2933 memory, the Ryzen 3 processor should enjoy a bandwidth of 35GB per second. Please note that I did opt for 2933 memory here, opposed to 3200, for the simple fact that some of our lower end Ryzen 5 CPUs still have trouble running higher clocked memory, so I'm going to assume most Ryzen 3 CPUs will as well. For measuring single and multi-threaded rendering performance, we have Cinebench R15, and here the Ryzen 3 processors stack up rather well. The single thread performance of the 1300X is just 5% down on the Core i5-7500, while the multi-threaded performance is 9% lower. That said, keep in mind that both the 1200 and 1300X will be fully unlocked, so chances are, with a little bit of tinkering, you can put both well ahead of the i5-7500 in this test. The four physical cores of the Ryzen 3 CPUs are able to match the two much higher clocked and hyper-threading enabled Core i3-7350K cores in the 7-zip file manager benchmark. Again, the R3-1300X wasn't that much slower than the more expensive i5-7500, while both easily beat the Pentium G4560, though that is a much cheaper CPU.
Moving to the Excel workload, I have to admit I was expecting the Ryzen 3 CPUs to perform much better here. Dropping SMT support along with lower operating frequencies and a reduction in the level 3 cache capacity has more than halved the performance from the 1500X. They also come in well behind the i3-7350K and miles behind the i5-7500. The R3-1200, for example, was only able to match the Pentium G4560 in its out-of-the-box spec. For general usage, the Ryzen 3 CPU should be comparable to the Pentium G4560 and Core i5-7500, and while we're certainly seeing this in the PC Mark 10 Essentials benchmark. The only issue here for the Ryzen 3 CPUs is the operating clock speed. Overclock them a little, and they will no doubt match the i5-7500. The productivity numbers are pretty much what we were expecting given the R5-1500X's performance. Also, given that the Core i3-7350K can be seen beating the Core i5-7500 in the spreadsheets test, and almost matching it for the writing test, it's clear to say this benchmark favours single-thread performance. The Ryzen 3 CPU scored very well in the photo editing test, crushing the dual-core Intel CPUs, while roughly matching the Core i5-7500. That said, the rendering and visualisation performance was lower than expected. Here, the R3-1300X roughly matched the i3-7350K. Then finally, for video editing, the Ryzen 3 processors find themselves situated between the Pentium G4560 and Core i5-7500. Certainly not a bad result, but again, this test prefers clock speed over core count. I had expected the Ryzen 3 CPUs to knock off the Core i3-7350K in the Corona benchmark, but it wasn't to be. The R3-1300X was still 7% slower and 16% slower than the i5-7500. The Pentium G4560 was also surprisingly slow in this test, very slow in fact given its clock just 17% lower than the 7350K, yet it was a little over 40% slower. This doesn't really make sense until you account for the fact that it does also have 25% less bandwidth at its disposal, so those two shortcomings combined have led to the G4560's downfall in this test. The G4560 also gets trashed in the Blender render test, though this time the Ryzen 3 CPUs look a lot more competitive as the R3-1200 matched the 7350K, while the R3-1300X edged ahead. Given that the Ryzen 5 1500X is slightly slower than the i5-7500 in a handbrake test, I wasn't expecting the SMT disabled Ryzen 3s to do well. That said, they do manage to edge out the Core i3-7350K, and through overclocking should come quite close to matching the 7500. For content creators on a budget, the Ryzen 3 CPUs look to be a godsend. The R3-1300 matched the i5-7500, and of course it does so at a much more affordable price. And again, it can be overclocked for even greater performance. The same is of course also true for the R3-1200. When it comes to gaming performance, the Ryzen 3 CPUs look as though they provide decent performance for a mid-range GPU, as they maintained well over 60 FPS at all times in our Battlefield 1 benchmark. Performance was comparable to the Core i3-7350K in this title, though it was a good bit slower than the Core i5-7500. Much the same is seen when testing with Mafia 3, the Ryzen 3 1200 and 1300X struggle against the Core i3-7350K, though they are clearly faster than the Pentium G4560. Again, decent performance here for those wanting to use a mid-range graphics card, but for anything faster than the GTX 1070, some serious overclocking will be required. Moving over to Hitman, we do see much more competitive performance from the Ryzen 3 CPUs. In fact, here the R3-1300X is able to match the Core i5-7500. It's also not a great deal slower than the R5-1500X, so overclocking the Ryzen 3 CPUs will bring them right into play here. Finally, we have Ashes of the Singularity, and this time the Ryzen 3 1300X is only able to match the Core i3-7350K with an average of 61 FPS, and this makes it quite a bit slower than the Core i5-7500. A bit of a disappointing result, but again, whereas the i5-7500 is limited to the performance seen here, it will be possible to squeeze more frames out of the Ryzen 3 CPUs through overclocking. Power consumption is about where you'd expect it to be. The Ryzen 3 1300 should consume around the same amount of power as the Core i5-7500. Keep in mind though, we are testing with a high-end X370 system with a liquid cooling pump and all that other extreme gear you can expect with a high-end rig. So in a lower spec system, you will see better numbers. So again, keep that in mind. Taking a final look at power consumption, we have the figures from the Cinebench R15 multi-threaded test, and here the Ryzen 3 CPUs look a little more hungry than the Core i5-7500, though the numbers are hardly extreme and this is just a simulated benchmark.
Okay, so based on these simulated benchmarks, Ryzen 3 certainly looks as though it's going to be very competitive. That said, though, as you might expect when compared to Intel processors or the Intel competition, AMD came out on top in some of the tests, while the Core i3-7350K and Core i5-7500 pulled ahead in others. Anyway, let's take a quick look at a few price versus performance scatter plots. As we saw previously, bang for your buck, the Ryzen 3 CPUs really deliver when working with Premiere Pro CC. They might not be the fastest CPUs, after all, both were slightly sold in the Core i5-7500, but given their price, the performance scene is commendable. The Ryzen 3 CPUs also deliver reasonable value in handbrake. The R3-1300X, for example, should be slightly more affordable than the i3-7350K, while it delivers slightly better performance. Meanwhile, the R3-1200 is a good bit cheaper, and it's also, again, slightly faster. Again, the Ryzen 3 CPUs do reasonably well in the 7-zip test, edging out the Core i3-7350K. That said, you do get 80% greater performance with the R5-1500X when compared to the R3-1300X for just a 46% increase in price. And of course, when taking the overall platform cost into account, the percentage will be even lower. When it comes to gaming, Ryzen 3 is going to be a mixed bag. That said though, with a mid-range graphics card, the R3-1300X and 1200 will deliver the same performance as the R5-1500X and Core i5-7500 for the most part. So it's a bit of a non-issue. That said though, with a powerful GPU such as the extremely overkill GTX 1080Ti, we see that for Hitman, the Ryzen 3 CPUs do trail the Core i3-7350K. At this point, I would just like to note that for my official Ryzen 3 benchmark video, I will be including a mid-range graphics card in the testing. Anyway, moving on, testing with Battlefield 1 shows that the Ryzen 3 1300X and Core i3-7350K to be on par in terms of performance. However, as we do expect the Ryzen CPU to be more affordable, therefore it should present better value. Again though, the R5-1500X does represent considerably better value when compared with a high-end GPU. Alright, so now we have a pretty good idea of how the Ryzen 3 CPUs are going to perform, and I'm extremely confident of the accuracy of the numbers just shown. Overall, the performance was pretty much as expected, um, I guess depending on how you look at it, uh, and that's both a good and bad thing for AMD's more affordable quad-core processors. For now, let's ignore the rest of AMD's own lineup and instead focus solely on the competing Intel chips. In terms of value, Ryzen 3 certainly looks to have the locked Core i5s well and truly beaten, especially if you take overclocking into account, which we haven't done here yet. Anyway, you can safely assume that it will be possible to boost the performance of these Ryzen 3 CPUs by at least 10%, and I'd say it'd probably be more likely around 15%. So the R3-1300X and 1200 are the obvious choice over the dual-core Core i3-7350K. That said, though, that was a CPU no one should have been buying anyway at $150 US. And this is kind of the problem Ryzen 3 faces. While superior in terms of value, it's pretty much beating an already beaten lineup. Even today, in mid-2017, if you want to build an affordable brand new computer, the Pentium G4560 still puts forward a very strong case. It enables playable performance in all the latest titles using an entry-level or mid-range graphics card, and it's extremely efficient. Going beyond Intel's Pentium G4560, I'd say that the Ryzen 5 1400-1500X seem like the obvious choice. And yet if you're really serious about your PC, just save up a little extra cash and get the 6-core R5-1600 and call it a day. For example, if you went with the cheapest possible gaming rig build with a basic B350 board, 8GB of DDR4 memory, a cheap case and power supply combo, say the GeForce GTX 1050 and a 500GB Seagate Fire CUDA for example, you'd save just 18% on the entire system build cost by opting for the R3-1200 over the R5-1600. So think about that for a moment. Basically, you're getting half as much level 3 cache, two less cores, and eight less threads. Also, for those of you wondering, the same system would be just 10% cheaper with the R3-1200 opposed to the SMT-enabled R5-1400. So again, spending a little more does seem to get you a lot more in this case. Still, if you're hell-bent on spending as little as possible, the Ryzen 3 1200 at just $110 US is a super chip. Things like overclocking, particularly with the stock cooler, are what I want to explore in next week's video, and that will tell us if the 1200 is indeed worth buying over Intel's G4560. I'm also assuming that the budget-orientated Wraith Stealth will be included with these CPUs. Speaking of the G4560, there is a rumor going around at the moment that Intel is discontinuing that CPU, or at least making it difficult to buy, which it has been for quite a while in the US. Right now in Australia, you can buy the chip quite easily. Um, they're 
very well priced, very competitively priced, in fact. But yeah, availability over in the US has been very poor. Um, that could be down to the extreme demand, or it could be down to Intel playing a bit of funny buggers. Wrapping things up, I'd say that the biggest problem for Ryzen 3 is AMD's own Ryzen 5 lineup. It's just so strong in terms of value, and that is going to make it difficult for Ryzen 3 to compete, in my opinion. Still, I feel like if most R3 1200 chips can overclock to a reasonable frequency using the box cooler, then that would indeed make them very enticing. Whatever way you look at it though, I think it's fair to say that Intel's mid-range lineup is already dead, so at least Ryzen 3's won that battle. Of course, the benchmarks shown in this video are simulated and the pricing is estimated, uh, so we'll have to wait till Ryzen 3 arrives next week before we can deliver any real concrete information. That said, I do believe this video to be accurate. My Ryzen 5 simulator video was spot on, so I see no reason why this should differ. For those holding out for Ryzen 3, I hope this video has been useful and perhaps you should just pull the trigger on an R5 1400 or more preferably the 1600 if you can stretch the budget that far. That's going to do it for this one. If you liked this video, please take a moment to help us out and hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that little notification bell to put yourself in contention to make that all-important first comment. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon, guys.